we've got enough people here so we can get started. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to this Data Week Online 2021 session, an interactive program of speakers and workshops showcasing the latest in data science and AI. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of admin before we start. We are recording this session and we'll be putting the video on YouTube at, uh, within the next couple of weeks. So if you're not happy with sharing your video, then please turn your video off. Uh, but it would be nice to see some faces during the uh, during the talk so we can see who we're talking to. It won't be your video uh, recorded when the slides are on. Please make sure you've read through our JGI code of conduct and virtual event policy. And Elaine has just put the link to that in the chat now. Please make sure you stay muted during the talk unless you're asking a question just for the sort of comfort of all the, other, uh, all the other attendees. We also have a registration and a feedback form. The registration form is just two questions. So it's very, very quick and we'd really appreciate it if you could fill this in. Elaine is just posting that in the chat now as we speak. So please check that out. And also please introduce yourself in the chat box as well. Next slide, please. So today, because we've got so many participants, we're going to be using a platform called Slido for questions and answers. This allows us to collect all the questions as we go through and you can actually upvote other people's questions uh, and then we'll go through the most popular questions at the end of the talk, as many that we have time to go through. So you can either scan this QR code with your phone or, or other device, or you can just go to the website slido.com and enter the code 386548, and that will get you through to the Q&A where you can ask a question. And those links are in the chat now as well. Next slide, please, Ian. So just a brief introduction to the Gene Golding Institute. My name is James Thomas. I am a data scientist at the JGI, and we are the central hub for data science and data intensive research at the University of Bristol. We're one of five university research institutes, and our aim is to connect multidisciplinary experts across the university and beyond. We work with four priority work streams, societal challenges, data visualization, so it's very apt for this, uh, this session, reproducibility and data governance and fundamental research. And we've got a number of cross-cutting activities that we do in order to promote those. And the first one, developing communities, is what we're doing here today at, at this Data Week session. Next slide, please, Ian. So we do have a packed week of events. We've got 40 events going on this week. If you like, uh, if you like this event, then I suggest you check out some of the other events. We'll be sharing some links at the end to some suggested uh, events that you might like to look at. But if you go to that website there at the bottom, bristol.ac.uk slash golding, then you can get this interactive timetable where you can click on any of the events and it will take you through to one of the registration links. Thanks, Ian. So thank you very much to all of our collaborators and sponsors, without whom we wouldn't have been able to put on this event for free for all of our attendees. So there's too many to mention by name, but we've put all of their uh, logos up there. So thank you very much to all of them for helping. And final uh, two slides. We'd really like it if you could connect with us and, and share your experiences of the event on social media. So you can use the hashtag Bristol Data Week or mention us at JGI Bristol. You can follow us on LinkedIn. And then there's a number of other ways you can get involved. Now we have a really, uh, what I think is a really good newsletter as well. So if you check out our website, there's a sign up form for the newsletter there. I do thoroughly recommend you sign up and uh, you can check out what's, what's going on at the JGI and the wider University of Bristol regarding data science. And final slide. So just a bit of a plug for our next big event, the Gene Golding Institute Showcase in 2022. It's happening early on in the year in February at MSHED in Bristol, the iconic uh, museum and building on the harbour side. And it, it'll be a family friendly event open to the public and there'll be speakers and opportunities to connect with, with other people in, in data science. So again, another, another event that I'd highly recommend. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this talk, uh, Professor Ian Nabney. He's school, sorry, head of, head of the School of Computer Science, Electrical and Electronic Engineering and Engineering Maths at the University of Bristol. His research spans both the theory and applications of neural networks and other pattern recognition techniques with a special focus on data visualization and probabilistic modeling. After receiving his PhD, he worked as a consultant before returning to academia, joining Aston University and lately Bristol. 
and his varied career means Ian has worked with a wide range of organizations from Rolls-Royce to Pfizer and Eon. So I'm very much looking forward to this talk. So um, take it away, Ian. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. So I'm going to try and give you uh, in, a, in a very short period of time uh, a summary of visual analytics, um, what it means to understand data by eye. So as an overview, a picture, it's often said, may be worth a thousand words, but it's only worth a thousand words if it's designed right. Visual representations of data can be used to help people carry out tasks more effectively. And the idea is to present data in a human readable way so that people can take action. So I'm very much interested in the, this, the whole end end to end thing about not just producing pretty pictures that, that look good in journal papers, but actually people taking action and do, making a difference uh, with the uh, images that they create. We're going to look at why we might visualize data, how we can visualize data, the links between data visualization, machine learning, and if we have some time, a few case studies towards the end. So, so what do we mean by visualization? Well, visualization allows people to analyze data when they don't know exactly what the questions are in advance. And the refinement of understanding takes place at speed as we actively scan a visual representation of data. In effect, the user is offloading the internal cognition and memory to the visual perceptual system. And that's a really good idea because actually almost half of our brain is devoted to the visual sense. So <laughs> getting that part, which works often in a large part in parallel, uh, is a way of really speeding up that understanding of uh, the information that we see around us. And it's particularly helpful for users who are not specialists in data modeling. You can use it, for example, to detect outliers, to find clusters and segment your data, to use it as an aid for feature selection, and also as feedback on the results of other analysis that you're doing, because you can see what you're doing and in that way make a, make a, a, a good interpretation of the results. And there are two principal aspects that I'm going to talk about today. One is information visualization which is the, if you like, the art and the skill and the science of presenting information in a visual way, and data projection, which is about taking uh, high dimensional data, multi-dimensional data, and projecting it in a meaningful way down to two dimensions so that we can then visualize it. So uh, a little history here. Um, the invention of data graphics required replacing map coordinates with more abstract measures. So atlases have been around for a very long time, maps have been around for a very long time, but actually the invention of a graph, XY coordinates and, and a line graph on that, is a surprisingly big and very late step. It was taken by, um, uh, I think a German, uh, Johann Heinrich Lambert in 1765, and perhaps more famously, William Playfair in 1785, who invented the line graph. So this is um, a picture taken from, um, let me just get a pointer here. This is a picture taken from one of Playfair's uh, books. Um, he wrote economics tracts, and this shows the, balance, the, the line of imports, which is this yellow line here, and the red line, which is the balance of exports for the UK, uh, between the UK and, and Denmark and Norway from 1700 to 1780. So we have along here, time axis up here, the um, imports and, and payments axis. And you, the point here being that he's also shaded it to show that we had, um, the country had a negative balance of payments in this pink region and a positive, positive balance of payments in this region here. And the crossover point happens uh, in, the, in the mid 1750s, i.e. well aligned with the start of the industrial revolution. Now, this was a surprising, like you, you if you were to be asked, when do you think that um, when do you think that a graph graphs like this were invented? I don't think um, people would think that it was in the late 18th century. And you know, we think of Descartes and the Cartesian coordinates, which underpins this. That was around in in the in the early 1600s. So it's a bit surprising that it took so long to get to the simple graph. What about visualization methods? Well, there are lots of different techniques. So we're not just um, kept to, to line graphs and bar charts that we're used to. Um, we might use, for example, a word cloud here. So here we have um, each word has a size proportionate to the frequency of which it, with which it occurs in, um, in, a, in a piece of text. And the, the plot here is of links between different uh, scientific disciplines where the links are designed by citations or cross citations between papers. And so this, this um, 
this, this um, undirected graph shows the links between different papers. And from that, we can build up information about how different disciplines link to each other. So for example, this region here is for maths and physics. Here we have health, here we have brain research and so on. So visualization methods are not just uh, constrained to relatively small, um, small sets of things. I think partly because of the, the obviously the revolution in computer graphics, uh, when Playfair produced his graphs, he had to draw them by hand and therefore it was he was quite limited. Obviously we have a lot more scope for different types of graph and graphics nowadays. And in particular, one of the revolutions that computer graphics has wrought in the last 20 to 30 years is the ability for interaction, for changing the view that we have. So this um, schematic here comes from Tamara Munzner's book and is all about the different sorts of ways in which we can manipulate a graphic. We can look at it changing over time. We can select points. We can navigate through it by zooming in. Uh, by panning or translating or by constraining the, 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 the field of view that we have. And we can also uh, interact by reducing the number of attributes by slicing through the data set, uh, cutting out certain uh, values or projecting the data. And the ability to interact with a graphic is a key benefit of computer over print. Uh, it adds functionality, of course, but it must be done with care to get the full benefit. And this also relates particularly to managing multiple linked views and reducing items and attributes. In particular, this idea that um, we can use interaction to show, for example, common data points across multiple different graphics is a really important tool in terms of helping the user to understand the full meaning of data. So uh, why do we bother having a human in the loop at all here? If um, the, the, the important point here is that Visualization techniques allow people to analyze data when they don't know exactly what questions they need to know in advance. And many uh, data analysis problems are quite ill-specified and actually question refinement takes place as part of the feedback. In addition, it, they can be used for in transitional purposes. So for example, to understand the requirements for a computational solution, uh, to refine a computational solution or to check an automated system but also for long-term use, often exploratory analysis, for example, for scientific discovery. So this is a uh, visualization tool that's being used in bioinformatics to try and understand uh, variants of um, uh, genetics, um, genetic coding for proteins. And it's the sort of tool that no doubt many people in, um, in biology labs around the world are using to try and understand COVID at this very moment. So why should we depend on vision? Why that sense rather than other senses? Well, as I mentioned earlier, almost half the brain is devoted to visual, the visual sense. And the way that we see things, the active vision that I'll describe in a bit more detail, means that we should think about graphic designs as cognitive tools enhancing and extending our brains. A significant amount of visual information processing occurs in parallel at the pre-conscious level, and we're leveraging this in our, our visualization tools. But we also have to think quite carefully about the physiology of this and we, about how we, our vision system actually works, because that impacts on the way that we should be designing the graphics that we produce in order to make sure that we perceive things strongly and accurately. We only have the illusion of seeing the world in detail. In fact, the brain grabs just those fragments that are needed to execute the current mental activity, and that's a really important uh, fact that we have to take into account. What about other senses? Well, we could use sound, uh, but sound is poorly suited to uh, representing information because it's a, sequ a sequential stream and uh, it's very time bound. It's very difficult to go back in time uh, and compare things, for example. Uh, taste and smell don't yet have viable recording and reproduction technology. Uh, perhaps one day we might be able to taste, um, taste a Gaussian, but we can't do that quite yet. And the haptic devices, touch in other words, provide only a very limited dynamic range. Um, our visual sense is much more discriminatory, discriminative and therefore is better suited to um, analysing data. So why show the data in detail? Well, there's a very simple argument for that, which is that if like the alternative to showing the data in detail is either to provide a massive spreadsheet with a whole load with lots of rows and columns, which is simply very confusing, or we can use summary statistics. But summary statistics are not the whole story. And there's a classic set of data sets um, due to Anscombe um, where these four data sets, which are both two, all of them are four of them are two dimensional. So we have uh, 
x and y coordinates in the first, second, third, and fourth data set here, all these data sets have the same mean variance and correlation. And yet, they're telling us very different things. So the first data set is roughly speaking, uh, there's a linear relation between y and x with a reasonable amount of, of added additive noise. The second data set, there's uh, clearly a nonlinear relationship between x and y, uh, quite a strong one and with very little noise. Uh, in the third data set, we have a strong linear relation between x and y that doesn't lie along the standard regression line because it's an outlying point here, which is distorting where the gray line, the regression line is, whereas the true relationship is a shallower line. And then uh, the fourth data set is something where there is, well, <laughs> basically not very much relationship between the two data points, uh, two, two variables at all. Um, most of the points here are clustered where at the point uh, x equals eight, uh, and the y values are fairly indiscriminately uh, scattered. And we simply have one more point here to give us the same mean variance and, and covariate correlation. So if I simply presented you with the three statistics, you wouldn't be able to tell which of these four data sets was uh, in front of you. And clearly the way that you interpret them and analyze them would be very different in each of the four cases. And apologies for the transitions. It seems that uh, PowerPoint has a mind of its own sometimes. So um, that's all very well. Um, so why don't we just, just draw some graphs? I mean, we, we know we know we can work on, work on with what Playfair has done. We can just produce graphs. Why should we analyze visualization systems? Well, first of all, um, good old Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. It's very important to examine and, and critique if you like, effectively everything that we do as data scientists. But also the analysis supports improved design up to a point. There's, there's always the scope for, for innovation and, and, and uh, imagination, but it can certainly support um, being a bit more systematic about it. And that's the point here is that the framework helps you think about design choices systematically. You think about what data the user sees, why the user uses a viz tool, and how the visual encoding and the interaction idioms are constructed in order to support the what and the why. And I think the important word here is user. It's been a bit salutary for me. I've been teaching a, a course for the first time on visual analytics to our MSc in data science, this, this teaching block, and I've just been marking all the coursework. And there's some fantastic work there. But the one thing that virtually everybody has not done is to think about the users of their system. So if there's one thing that you take away from this, it's to think about the users. And that's really important. I can give you a, a little uh, war story around that. Many moons ago, I was doing some work in, in data projection methods for Pfizer uh, down in Sandwich in Kent, and I produced a graphic of their high throughput screening results, and I showed them, and this was taking 16-dimensional data and projecting down to 2D and showing clusters and everything, and it was really fascinating. They were absolutely fascinated by this, and they said, this is brilliant, you know, fantastic. Can you tell me what's going on in the bottom right hand corner of the screen what are the data points there all about and i had to point i had to i sort of paused and i said well i could write some matlab code and i could dig out what those points are but what it really brought home to me is that we're doing this for a purpose we're not just doing this for this picture we're doing this so that users can answer queries about their system and to do that we have to provide the interaction and the tools they need to dig down into the data and get the answers that they require so thinking about the user why they're using the tool and what they're seeing is critical to a good design so the first stage really is to do a task analysis and to understand that task in terms of certain basic types of, of analytical uh, things you might want to do. So you might want to analyze the data, either to consume some data or to produce new data. You might want to search for uh, targets or locations, or you might want to query in various ways. And I, I haven't got time today to go through all the, the manifestations of this, but these are basically the, the key types of uh, visualization tasks that you might want to do and understanding the particular task your your user has in these terms helps you in terms of designing a good system for them to use so here we go here's the the first uh, first task for you of the day here I have um, uh, some data that has been derived from ECG analysis so I worked uh, some years ago on a, a project where we were looking at uh, ECG gathered off uh, individual subjects. Uh, I'm afraid that wasn't me in, a, in my younger years. It's a, it's a, it's a model. 
um, and you attach the, the, the device by three electrodes to the chest, you measure several tens of thousands of heartbeats, you then take those heartbeats, segment the data, take various measurements of timing and heights of various peaks, and you end up with a 13-dimensional data set. And what we've done is projected that data down to a two-dimensional space here. The axes have, have no interpretation. This is a nonlinear projection of the data. What I have done to help is to color code the, um, the various uh, data points by the type of heartbeat. So the blue ones are sinus rhythm, which is the, the standard uh, heartbeat when everything's going fine. And the, the green and the red are two different types of what are called ventricular ectopic heartbeats, which are heartbeats triggered from the wrong part of the heart. And um, uh, so those are, are two types of, if you like, bad beats. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause and, um, it's going to be a bit difficult to actually do interactively now I think about it. Um, perhaps you would like to write into the chat um, some, some thoughts on what you see in the data and we'll come back and look at those perhaps at the end of my talk when we come to the question session. So write into the chat or perhaps into the Slido what your, what your take on that data is just looking at it in that two-dimensional space. Okay, well, perhaps I'll, I'll give, a, give a little uh, hint towards some of the things you might notice from this. So, first of all, we notice that the blue, the green, and the red areas are pretty well separated. What that tells us is that the original data set, the original variables, are really quite effective in terms of allowing us to classify different heartbeats. If I were to, even projecting down to 2D, I still get good separation. So in the original space, these clusters must have been very well separated. And therefore, the, the features that we've got describe the data really well in terms of classification. We can notice very quickly we have some outliers. So we have some green points here. We have a blue dot here. Perhaps more outliers on the red data. Those would uh, pay further study having a look at them individually, seeing what's different about them. Are they genuinely different sorts of heartbeat? Are they artifacts of, for example, uh, um, electrode slipping or other problems with the recording? We notice that there are some, some areas of overlap. There are some blue points here in amongst the green. So what are those ones particularly looking like? We would again bring up those individual data points, a green point here in amongst the red, and perhaps a hint here in the green of different clusters. So a, a very dense region here, a second one here, and a third one there, that again would repay further study. So we've taken um, about uh, 1,200 data points and very quickly enabled people who are not experts in cardiology to raise some really interesting hypotheses and questions about this data that can then be analyzed further. And that's really the power here of, of visualization, of the combination of data projection and visualization in the sense that it's a very quick way of getting some really interesting information and raising interesting questions about your data. Okay, so how do we actually think about um, the world when we're looking around it? We have the impression that we see the world vividly, completely, and in detail, but this impression is completely wrong. At any given instant, we apprehend only a very tiny amount of the information in our surroundings, but it's usually just the right information to carry us through the task of the moment. So the task of the moment we were just looking at was trying to understand that, uh, that data set Obviously, in, in, the, in the real world, we have many other sorts of tasks that we have to do, and we're using that visual information to help us do them. Now, keeping a copy of the entire world that we see in our brains would be a huge waste of cognitive resources. It's much more efficient to see only what we attend to and only attend to what we need. So the important thing here is that, um, as we'll see in a moment, uh, the, the way that we see is, is both based on bottom-up and also top-down uh, analysis in our brains. 
So our illusory impression that we're constantly aware of everything happens because our brains arrange for eye movements to occur and relevant information to be picked up just as we turn our attention to something we need. And this understanding through, uh, obviously, um, neurophysiology has led to a profoundly different model of perception than our naive one. And the really important thing then is what impact does that have on graphic design? So we have to remember that our visual thinking consists of not just looking at a graph and taking it all in at once, but actually a series of acts of attention, driving eye movements and tuning our pattern finding circuits. So if we look at a bar chart, for example, we might start off by looking across here and here and here at the different heights of the bars. Then perhaps we might look down here and look across here one by one at the different pieces of text and then uh, see what the y-axis is. And so we'll actually look at multiple different points in that graphic at different times and then use our memory to put the whole thing together. So if we had our task was to find out which kind of fruit import is the largest by dollar value, we would make visual queries to find the tallest bar and then look down and find and read the label underneath. If we're looking at this map of France, to find a fast route, say, between Calais and Marseille, we would first make visual queries to find the starting Calais and ending Marseille cities, and then make queries to find a connected red line indicative of fast rows between those points. So these visual queries are our acts of attention in the graphic, and understanding how they work can make us better designers. So it all starts with um, our retina. Uh, and the correspondence between the retina and, if you like, pixels in the brain. And the point, important point here is that at the, the very center of the brain, of the, sorry, the, of the retina, we have the fovea and the parafovea. Over half of our visual processing power is concentrated in this central region here. And we can resolve about 100 points on the head of a pin held at arm's length in that range. But at the very edge of the visual field, we can only barely see something the size of a fist at arm's length. So in other words, our refinement in terms of precision of sight is very dependent on where in the field of view that we're actually looking. And this is, of course, exactly why we move our eyes around. We have that, those visual queries to understand any object that we're looking at, because we need to bring it into focus. We need to bring it into focus in the center of the retina uh, in uh, different parts of it in order to understand that image. So half our visual brain power, therefore, is directed to processing less than 5% of the visual world. And that's why we have to move our eyes. So strong eye muscles attached to each eyeball rotate it rapidly so that different parts of the visual world become imaged on the central high resolution fovea, and they accelerate the eyeball to an angular velocity of up to 900 degrees per second, and then stop it all in less than one tenth of a second. And controlling these eye movements is a key part of the skill of seeing. So how does that relate to what we're, we're doing here? Well, the human perceptual system is fundamentally based on relative judgments, not absolute ones. So for example, the amount of length difference we can detect is a percentage of the object's length, not the absolute length of that difference. And that principle holds for all true for all sensory modalities. Our senses work through relative rather than absolute judgments. So here we have three different ways of presenting um, uh, two, two, the value of two variables, A and B here. We have uh, three different bar charts. We have one here which the bars are unframed and unaligned. We have one here where they're framed and unaligned, and one here where they're unframed but they're aligned. So the framing here is this point here, the, the white area. So if we look at these, the question is, which of these is best for making a very quick determination of which of the two values is the bigger one? And the answer for, for most people, and hopefully for you, is that this takes longer to work out that A is bigger than B than this one does, and then this one is the best. Now, how does that relate to what we've learned about eye movements in the fovea? Well, the answer is that here we have to look at the top and the bottom and the top and the bottom of both bars, and then if like mentally work out which one we think is longer and perhaps have to go back and compare them and work out maybe this distance here is smaller than this distance here and therefore A is bigger. With the framing, we're helped by the fact that the 
the, the end of the box uh, is shorter and therefore the relative difference in the white areas is bigger than in the blue areas. So in other words, it's easier to see that this white area here is bigger than this white area here. And therefore, because it's the negative of the value, B is smaller than A. Whereas with unframed and aligned, we, know, we don't have to look at the bottom at all. We can just assume that those are level. We just have to run our eyes across and are we running them horizontally or are we having to dip down? So in other words, this understanding of the way that we do visual queries is really helpful in terms of deriving principles of how to present data so that it can be understood uh, quickly and accurately. So the, the act of perception then um, is a, a very complex process. We have at the low level, we have information arriving in the, in, the, in the retina. We have then in the brain, low level feature processes that are running in parallel over every part of the visual field. And millions of features are processed simultaneously. Each of these feature detectors is looking for one very specific thing. So um, these um, white and black uh, regions are looking for edges. These colored ones are looking for colors. This is a horizontal edge detector. This is a vertical edge detector. These are um, uh, uh, slanted edge detectors and so on. So we get millions and millions of features being processed simultaneously, uh, some of which will fire at certain locations. The brain at the next level then puts together patterns out of the features depending on our attentional demands, which is a fancy phrase for what we're looking for. So if we're looking for the height of the bars, then we'll be looking for those vertical and horizontal uh, edges as a way of determining what the bars are and where they are. And that attentional tuning reinforces those which are most relevant to the task and removes um, our understanding of or the, the recognition of the other elements of the of field of view. And then we build the patterns into objects and the ones that are most relevant to the task at hand are held in visual working memory and at any instant a very small number up to about three are held uh, in that memory. And objects can have both non-visual and visual attributes. So here's a dog We've recognized a fuzzy version of its face. We've recognized the outline of its back and its legs and its tail. And with that, we also associate some words. Um, uh, so what a dog might be, you might consider a dog to be a loyal, a pet, friendly and furry if you like them, and perhaps other words if you don't. And the important thing is this two-way process. So the bottom-up information drives pattern building and the top-down attentional process is reinforced relevant information. So when we're designing a visual analytic system, we need to think very carefully what the tasks are and therefore what these, these, these top-down uh, attentional processes are, but also we have to take account of the, the physics, the psychophysics of the visual system in order to design the system so that these pattern detectors, these feature detectors, are doing a lot of the work for us because that's crucial to that fast and accurate recognition of what is going on in the data. And uh, it's also been shown in these psychophysical experiments that there's a power law of perception. So our perception of sensation S is the physical intensity I to some power, and we want phenomena with N close to one. And uh, so this graph represents or schematically represents the relationship between the perceived sensation and the physical intensity. And the important part of this graph is this line here, that length has a power law of very close to one. In other words, we perceive length accurately in terms of as a length doubles, we perceive it as doubling. Um, two other uh, measures that we see visually, for example, area, actually we don't perceive in a linear way, so we underestimate the size of larger areas compared to smaller ones, similarly with depth, and brightness is less good still, so brightness is only perceived at 0.5, so we shouldn't be putting our most important variables in a brightness channel because um, our perception of different levels of brightness is not that accurate. There's also a question of gradation and, and refinement, and we can't perceive that many different brightness levels anyway. Whereas uh, saturation of color, actually we overperceive the importance of that. Uh, and um, we did talk about haptics briefly. Uh, I'm not recommending this, but apparently someone has done some experiments, hopefully with very light um, electric shocks, and we, 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 we do not respond to those linearly, which I think will probably come as no surprise to anybody. So when we're looking at representing magnitudes, it's been shown that the best way of doing of representing them in terms of the accuracy of perception is first of all 
aligned against a common scale, then unaligned position against an identical scale, then length, then angle, and then area judgments, but area is much less accurate than all the other ones. So if you're trying to represent um, more than two variables, you might need to use other channels to represent some things. You start off with position, then use length, angle, and so on as the, as the number of variables goes up. So let's, um, let's have a little more history. Um, let's look at some, uh, an example of how visual analytics has been used in practice. And the famous uh, map uh, produced by John Snow, um, who was um, uh, a medic back in the 1850s. And it was a time when there were regular outbreaks of cholera in London. Uh, and for the 1854 cholera outbreak, he presented two maps. Um, first one was shown uh, at a meeting of the London Epidemiological Society, and then he wrote a book on the mode of communication of cholera. And this is um, a version of his map here, um, where we have obviously a geographic map, but we have a set of bars, and each bar represents the number of deaths in particular places. And the idea behind this is that you can then see where the density of uh, deaths is highest, and there's a clear geographic relationship to that. Uh, and it's centered around this region here, and it turns out that, um, as many of you may know the story, that there was a water pump that was used to supply um, water to people in this in this in this area, and that pump was contaminated with so the well was contaminated with sewage, and so the um, the solution to the problem was simply to remove the pin from the handle of the pump so it couldn't be used anymore. So people had to go elsewhere for their water. That's the sort of the, the nice um, nice story about this. Um, it's not absolutely as simple as that, but it's still a good story. There's also uh, a very interesting corollary to this is that there was someone who died. Uh, in Highgate from this outbreak of cholera and it turned out that they had used to live in this part of, of London and liked the taste of the water so much that they had bottles of it sent up to their, their, um, their house in Highgate and uh, drank it and of course then unfortunately died from the contaminated water. So there was another if you like, epidemiological link uh, but the visual representation is really helpful in trying to understand how cholera might have been transmitted and there's some links on the slides that you can get more detail from. Okay, so um, I will just uh, move on from that. This is a really nice illustration of uh, visualization uh, for use, being used for public health. Other ways that we might use visualization for good, and I'm looking at the time and thinking we're, we're, I'm gonna have to skip over these. Um, uh, so um, Hans Rosling uh, was a great exponent of dynamic scatter plots uh, with additional attributes and their application to public health. This is a fantastic visualization um, which shows um, for each country the, um, uh, the GDP on one axis and the, uh, sorry, the death rates on one axis and the um, GDP on another axis and how that changes over time and different countries grow and, and, and indeed shrink. And you can see as you animate it, catastrophic events where the, the um, life expectancy drops by several years in a single year. And you can pick out some of those quite easily. So 1845, Ireland, that'll be the potato famine. 1850 in Algeria, 1871 in France, that's be the Franco-Prussian War. 1876 in India, which is a great famine. And 1918, almost everywhere, the combination of the First World War and of course the so-called Spanish flu pandemic uh, in that year. And then a really another really good example of this, um, was made 121 years ago by an all black team led by the famous um, black activist W.B. Du Bois in the United States about the um, uh, visualizations and uh, the different uh, outcomes for black and white um, people in the Southern states of uh, the United States of America. And what's salutary to remember is that although it might have been 121 years ago, uh, that was only 37 years after the end of slavery in the United States. I think it'd probably be quite interesting to see what those graphs look like nowadays as well. Um, probably have changed rather less than we would like to see. So here's um, a particular picture uh, of some of the examples. That, and these, of course, were all hand drawn. Um, and this is looking on the left hand side of the occupations of Negroes and whites in Georgia, just to say that Negro was the the standard term for uh, the black population of the United States at the time and used by W.B. Du Bois himself uh, in his work. And uh, so you can see that a large proportion of both uh, 
both uh, ethnic groups uh, are involved in agriculture, uh, fisheries and mines, uh, but the domestic and personal service, the yellow part, many fewer whites were involved than blacks in that and so on. So you can see quite graphically the different treatment or the different ca um, characteristics and, and opportunities for uh, the different races in the country at the time. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm aware that there was hope for doing some questions, um, and I have a, quite a few slides to go. Do, do you want me to stop there and take questions, what I've done so far, or shall I press on a little bit? We do have the possibility that you we could answer questions in the Slido, um, and we can put them in as comments, so people can always get the answers to their questions after the talk. So if you, it's up to you, Ian, if you prefer okay, to I'll, carry I'll on. perhaps just do five more minutes or so. Um, okay. And just talk about the, so I've been talking very much about the information visualization part of the work that, that I and others do. A key, a key um, complement to that is data projection. And the, the reason for this is that the visualization techniques I've been talking about are, always, are very much about representing a relatively small number of variables, up to say four or five in a, in a single uh, visualization, and perhaps linking together multiple visualizations to explain things in greater detail, but you can't often really get to grips with the full multivariate nature of data. You have to select a small number of variables and, and hope that those are the most important ones, and of course that's not, life isn't as simple as that. When we were looking at the, um, the heart rate, that's the heartbeat data, we could see there that um, uh, we, 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 although we have good separation, we actually need virtually all the 13 attributes to, to, to separate that, those classes out. And if we just looked at a couple of variables, we would not have got such good class separation. So the goal here is to project data to a lower dimensional space, usually 2D or 3D, while preserving as much information or structure as possible. The things we were looking at, like clusters, like separation of classes, like outliers, and so on. And um, the reason we need to do machine learning on this for this is that the quantity and complexity of many data sets means that simple techniques such as principal component analysis are often not very effective. You essentially get a circular blob in the middle of the screen without much differentiation uh, or insight into the structure of the data. And um, we have to deal here with uncertainty. Doubt, as Voltaire said, is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. We have to deal with uncertainty, and the optimal formalism for doing that is probability theory. And we're going to use Bayesian inference to reason probabilistically about the model as well as the data. And one of the key tools in doing this is something called the generative topographic mapping, which um, works as follows. We have a latent space, a visualization space here, um, which we're going to assume has generated some high dimensional data. So we're representing that by this 3D plot over here. In practice, of course, it will be much higher dimension than that. We have a nonlinear mapping from the latent space to the visualization space. And to turn this into a probability distribution, we uh, attach Gaussian blobs represented by these green circles here to the manifold, the nonlinear manifold that we map the, the, this, this uh, two dimensional space to. So the model for the data is that it's generated by a set of Gaussian balls that are in this high dimensional space. And those Gaussian balls are all sent, attached to a flexible, if like rubber sheet. It's been twisted and stretched from its original form to fit the data. Now you might say, well, that's all very well, but I don't really care how the data was generated. What I want to do is visualize it in this space. Now, one of the advantages of using um, probability models, probabilistic models here, is that we can use Bayes' theorem to invert this. So this model says, how do I generate um, the probability of, of Y given the latent space X and the weights in the model? And Bayes' theorem enables us to turn that round and to compute the probability of X, the latent space, given a data point and the weights of the model. And so that's the fundamental approach that we use to produce probabilistic models that we can use for visualization. We can then combine that with some of the techniques I've been talking about to create an interactive visualization tool, which enables us to explore high dimensional and complex data. And this is taken from um, uh, 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 searches for, for drug or possible drug-like molecules that Pfizer has run high throughput screening for. And what we can do is color code this by the number of biological targets that we are active against and do local search, uh, local search and, and visualization of different parts of that space.
but I'll have to have to move on from that point. We can also, using this probabilistic approach, build hierarchical visualizations where we do a visualization at, uh, at the global level of the whole data set and then gradually, with the help of the user, refine that visualization at different levels of detail to get more information out of the data set. So, for example, um, this, this plot here corresponds to this part of the data, and we can see how we have um, green data points, cyan data points, and blue data points all in separate clusters. And again, we can refine that further at this next level down. Here's uh, a similar plot of a hierarchy with a slightly different sort of form of model called a Gaussian process latent variable model. And it's looking at proteomic data, and it shows how um, by drilling down into the data, we can see more structure. So here we have uh, the original visualization. We have put um, a number of uh, regions on top of that. And for example, this first region here, when we drill down into it, we can see uh, a, a subclusters within that what originally is a sort of looks like a single cluster of data, we can see more detail within it uh, in this point. Um, similarly, uh, for example, sort of submodel, um, should we say six, which is again looking like a fairly uniform cluster. Again, we can see in this, re in this plot here, much more fine levels of detail in terms of the clustering, which correspond in this case to families of proteins. Right, I have got some other case studies, but I will skip over them for now. And put the fine, my final thought slide up. So I would say this has been a timely lecture. The pandemic has been illustrated by graphics of many different types and indeed different quality. And just as the population of, well, the world has learned about infection models and the dreaded R, it's also learned, for example, the value of log scales on graphs. Uh, and there have been a wide range of different topics that have been covered uh, in terms of the, the pandemic. Uh, for example, heat maps of hospital admissions, the change in acceptance of vaccination in France over time, uh, a graphic um, of showing false information being spread about the pandemic. So lots of different ways that graphics have been used in this pandemic. So we need to understand the vast quantities of data surround us and visualization machine learning can work together to help us in that task. These models can be used to help uncover the hidden meanings of data. And visual analytics is a powerful tool that provides insight to non-specialists. And while ethics is important wherever we do in data science, it's particularly important here because this is one of the primary communication tools that we use to communicate complex statistical ideas to people who are not trained as statisticians. And therefore it's really important that we get it right. Um, I would say a probabilistic approach provides many benefits. I haven't really had much time to talk about most of those uh, in this talk, but I can, I can do that at greater length another time. And importantly, it's a multivariate, multi-skilled and collaborative effort to create really great visualizations. So thank you very much for your attention. I shall um, stop the share and go back to the screen. Thank you very much, Ian. It's a very interesting talk and a very very interesting topic as well and a wealth of information there so um it's definitely a challenge for you to get through it all in just one session so thanks very much for uh, endeavoring to do your best to, to cover as much as you could um we have been getting some questions in on the slido and I, i'm wondering we are a little bit short for time but if we could maybe just take one or two of them and really good Happy to see to. that there are some links that, that people are sharing in the chat as well which we will uh, save as well so any, anything that's, uh, that's that's useful we can share um the the most voted question on the slido is what in your opinion is the most common issue with visualizations produced in research and what do you think is the most helpful thing we should think about that's a really good question um i should also add i could do a plug i, I did do a course on visual analytics um so uh, there are a whole set of uh, recordings and indeed lab classes if you want to, to do them available on blackboard for people who are in bristol um so the most important thing i think is to start with the end in mind and the end in mind is the user and what they're going to do with that visualization so the more you can understand the task that they're trying to perform the more you can make sure that the visual representation We'll provide them with the information they need to do and also importantly these days the interaction is going to help them answer the questions that they have so there's schneiderman's mantra of you know overview first um, zoom and 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 look at details and then details on demand that sort of general approach is really helpful and, and tamara munzner's book also has 
something like six or nine uh, thumb, um, uh, rules of thumb for producing good visualizations. But it starts with really understanding what the task is. Uh, and that was what was so salutary to me about talking to the Pfizer, people from Pfizer was the realization that for me at that point, doing the data science and, and you know, the machine learning and producing a great visualization was the end point. Whereas for them, that was merely the starting point. And that has triggered off a lot of really interesting research for me since then. Thank you, Ian. And uh, actually, that, that sort of helps answer the, the next question on the slider, which is, does the UOB, University of Bristol, have any data visualization teaching units that you know of beyond general use of programming languages, more about visualization specifically? So I guess sure. that's so, so <laughs> yes, the visual analytics unit again. that we delivered on the MSc data science for the first time this year. So um, um, well, one benefit of the pandemic is that all the lectures, as I said, are recorded. Um, there are lab classes with lab worksheets as well. Um, so for the practical side of things. So um, I'd certainly be happy to talk to people about the potential for, for making that available. I think I probably need to get the coursework marked first so that I, I, I don't. <laughs>